Hello and welcome to Ways to Change the World. I'm Christian Giri Murphy and this is the podcast in which we talk to extraordinary people about the big ideas in their lives and the events that have helped shape them. My guest this week is one of the original superstar DJs of the 80s and 90s. Carl Cox helped bring Acid House from the warehouses of Chicago to British raves, the unregulated party scene, then festivals and clubs, and he's still going, he's still huge. So he's written a book all about his life. Oh yes, oh yes. Carl, welcome to the podcast. (laughs) Thank you. Why have you done the book? I think more than anything, I think it's a great story based on my parents coming over from West Indies back in the late 50s into the 60s. And the reason why they were here was to basically build up the economy uh, after the war. And that was their values. I mean, my dad was a bus driver and my mother was a midwife. So I was born in in Manchester um, in 1962. I don't really remember much of it because I was only like six months old until I was uprooted from Manchester to South London. And then that's where I kind of grew up in South London, then ended up on the South Coast eventually in in the 80s, uh, where my kind of career started started to take off. But I think the book was more to do with people trying to understand me a little bit more than just a DJ that went to Ibiza and made it. Because that's a short story, it'd be like two pages and that'd be the end of the read. There's a lot of life and times and things that happened, a lot of ups and downs that happened in my life that a lot of people don't know about. The music industry is one thing, but my life within the music industry is something else. I I should help listeners actually, who may have heard that rumbling underneath our conversation. We are actually recording this in Fabric the nightclub um, in, in Smithfield, uh, and we're very close to the London Underground, so you might hear the occasional rumble. But this is actually one of the... I think it's your top London club at the back of the book when you yeah, list your favourite nightclubs. Yeah, fabric. It's an um, important place for you. It, it, it is. I've had some really amazing times here, and the clubs have stood the test of time, as you can imagine. So we're both here still. <laughs> after everything, after the adversity of what this club's been through as well. So let's go back to childhood that you were talking about. Because it was your dad, really, who introduced you to DJing, wasn't it? Well, here's the thing. It wasn't my dad that introduced me to DJing. My dad introduced me to the music that he was playing, and he was technically DJing, but entertaining his guests at the house that I was basically brought up, brought up in and, and where me and my sisters lived in. So we had no choice <laughs> but to listen to my dad's music uh, being played loud while we are upstairs in our room uh, of his selection of music, which I was interested what in. What was it? Um, at that time, it was James Brown, Aretha Franklin, Sam and Dave, Isaac Hayes, Booker, Booker T and the MGs, Green Onions, uh, Dolly Parton, Elvis Presley, Jim Reeves, Dwayne Eddy. It was such an eclectic sound. So it was music you would dance to, it if was, not dance music. Yeah, but, yeah. so, so it, it was, every time my dad played something, my dad, mum and dad's friends would always react to whatever it was. So if it was, if it was Stand By Your Man, my Dolly Parton, they all would be singing, Stand By Your Man, you know, and I'd be upstairs trying to get to sleep. <laughs> and that was all I could hear. But there was one day that I came down, came out, came down out of my room and I was sitting on the, on the, on the banisters and I'm downstairs and I could see my mum and dad's friends dancing away and having a good time with this music. And my dad came out to go and get some drinks from the kitchen and he looked up at the banisters and he said, look son, you can either go to bed or try and go to sleep, or you can come downstairs and put these records on, because at the time, the player was a, a mono player, which had a, a stacking system for 45-inch records to go onto, and you had about 10 records, and you cho- chose the records that you wanted each one to play, and then that's how they it used to, down. They, they used to yeah. happen. So you had this gap, then a record, then a gap, then a record. And, 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 and my dad had a big file of records sitting by the side, but he was always busy with my family uh, friends, so he felt that, you know, I could be someone that could fill his void. And that's, how, and that's how it started. And that was when I was eight years old. So when did you start buying records, you know, in, 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 in large numbers? And how were you paying for it? I mean, you weren't a rich family or anything. No. You? So at the beginning, I was going to the record store with my father. And, uh, and some of the records that he was buying, I didn't like. So he said, if you, you want to buy records, you buy it out of your own money. So I was doing a milk round, which most of the kids have no clue what that is, and, and paper round to pay for my records I was buying. And the first record I bought was uh, Diana Ross, Love Hangover. And this is like a track which starts off as a ballad, more or less, and it goes into disco music. And, uh, and that was probably the first record that I, I've actually bought with my own money uh, and then built my record collection from that kind of, that record. So I, I, I have in my record collection today 
roughly around 150,000 pieces of vinyl from a collection started from 1968 all the way through until roughly about 2006. So that's a lot of tunes. What did you think you were going to be in those days? I didn't really know what I was going to be. I, I tried a lot of things. I was really into uh, to motor cars and motor mechanics. Uh, so I was doing a degree in that and also electrical engineering. Because I was at the time being a DJ, I was also building my own mobile disco units. I was building my own speakers, making amplifiers, EQs, all that kind of thing. The actual crossroads I had was in 1985, where I was a scaffolding. And it was earning good money as a scaffolder, but on the weekends I'd be DJing with my sound system. And, and it came to a point where I had to choose one or the other. So I decided to, to choose DJing. And of course my money went right down when I did that. So, so, but I actually started from the Princess Trust. The Princess Trust came about uh, to enable you know, young businesses to, 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 to grow and flourish with a certain amount of money that they could put towards the, 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 the amount that I had already invested in my disco unit, which was a thousand pounds. If I could show that I could raise a thousand pounds, they put a thousand pounds in for the government. And then, and then I had to uh, go to a business school in Battersea for, for 10 weeks to learn about profit and loss and, and accounts and, and how to run an uh, initial business and be taught that. And once you have passed that as a certificate and then you're let on your merry way um, to, con to continue your quest on what you would like to try and do. But there was, this was quite a big and fast turnaround for you, wasn't it? Because you had spent your 18th birthday in, in jail. Yeah, I, I got incarcerated for driving on a band twice. Um, I've never known anyone that's driven in the band and, and had to be, you know, go into a place called Blantyre House for three months. But that gave me a lot of discipline in, in, in you know, respecting others, respecting the system, uh, respecting the ideals that you just can't do that. And I understood it, but I always felt that I could always get away with driving without documents. And, um, you know, I mean, for me, it was a massive learning curve. At the end of the day, that, that could happen to me or anyone else. So when you say you decided you wanted to be a DJ, what did being a DJ mean in 1985? Because that was when it was really just changing, wasn't it? From yeah. smashing and nicely playing some records and talking into the mic it was, to yeah. a different kind of culture. It was difficult, difficult because you needed to have a real true career. You needed to be a radio presenter. You needed to be on the radio. You needed to be a part of success, even if it was local radio or, or you was on Capital Radio at the time or, or Radio One, you needed to be at the top of that tree to be successful. But I was always the go-to person for any event. And I was, did plenty of weddings, uh, plenty of school discos, bar mitzvahs. I did, I did a lot, but I, but I turned them all into my own inevitable way, my own sound. You would get your top 40 sound, but you would also get the sound of the, the OJs. And, and I used to get booked all the time because of the way how I, how I did that. So I think this is where you have to, for a lot of our audience, explain really what being a DJ is now. Because it's not just about playing records. No. So what, when you talk about performing, what is being a DJ now? I think being a DJ is, is more, you've got to have a, a passion for it. You've got to love the music that you're choosing. You've got to be in it. You, you need to understand where the record's going to start, where, where, it, where it is in the middle and where it's going to end, so you can do the transition to the next track. Um, you've got to understand that there's going to be peaks and troughs in your music. So I'm kind of treating DJing as being a bit of a musician. If I was here playing a guitar to you now, I'll be playing some, you know, some really good you know, records that'll get you singing, and then I'll take you on a journey where I'm, I'm, there's a track that'll be wearing my heart on my sleeve, and then I have some sort of thing at the end where you're all going to clapping kumbaya and everything, and everyone's happy. Um, but the idea of it is that you take the journey of that, you know. So not everything is about big records, big commercial records, you know. Not everything is about even just you making records and it's all your music that people are listening to. I think it's just understanding what your position is in the end of the day but people who want to be entertained by who you are as, as a DJ and stand by that. But technically as well can you talk me through it because you're making music as well as playing music mm. um, and you're famous for three decks. Yeah. So, so what is it you're doing? How are you creating something different from the kit of parts that you've been given? Yeah well most of the time you see DJs playing on two turntables and because that's at the particular time of playing the vinyl music, the, the art of, of mixing records together was all about what you could do, not what now digitally 
what the computers can do for you. So it's the other way around when, when the actual art of DJing really comes from a raw place. The raw place is that this record will play and this one you have to mix in to get that transition right to hear the next record. I didn't use the third turntable until I knew I could do that first. Uh, so I used to drive my sisters and my mum and dad mad in my bedroom and for five years I was just mixing and cutting the same record <laughs> until one day I felt that I could use the third one as another turntable, not because it's just someone going to put whale noises on or, or just acapellas or anything. I'm putting another record on this one. So I know that these two are, are mixing in the way that they can and they're kind of more or less locked in. And then I can spin the third one in and, then, and almost remixing music as I'm playing. So in a world where it's all done on the laptop now mm. and the computer does the thinking, what is creative about DJing? Yeah, I mean, now it's all down to selection more than anything else. I still don't use the computer in that way. I now use the CD players. They have a sync button on the CD players, but if, I can tell you, I never use the sync. There's a little button on there, white. It's always out. And I still use the players as if I was playing turntables. So you but, sync it yourself? So I still play and sync the, the records, but it's, it's, it's the only way how I can create my energy, my vibe. If I had everything in sync, and then I might have finished DJing tomorrow because it's, it's a little bit too easy to be able to just make your music from that kind of ideal that everything's perfect. I mean, I think the best sets are the ones that are imperfect because they know that you are working the music to the best of your ability to, to, to get your sound across in your way. Can you take me back to the rave scene? How did you become so big there? Was it the music or the gear or a bit of both or what, you know? I think what was great about the rave scene is that I, I make a party anywhere. So, I mean, even where we are now, if you have some speakers and some decks, I mean, we can have a really good time. It's not a problem. The rave scene was something of a wonder. You know, what's going to happen? Who's coming? What DJ is going to be playing? It? What laser system? What sound system? What music is going to be playing? How long are we going to dance for? And that kind of thing. When are the police going to show up? Yeah, yeah, well, everything. <laughs> you know, it's, it's, you know, the police are outside, but they're not coming in. So we've got a good couple more hours. Oh, I need to make the noise. The, the, more than anything, we never had that like, social media like we have now. We never had GPS. We never had helicopters flying overhead, you know, following us. We, we didn't have any of it. We, we just had answer phones and we had pages. And for far as I could say, I wasn't sure how elaborate these raves are going to end up, but it got to, to such an extent that they had to be policed. And if you could do a party, then you would have to get you know, special licenses and that sort of stuff. So everything is above board for you. When you buy a ticket, you know that the services are there and you're going to be taking, looked after um, if anything happens to you and all this sort of stuff. So it got out of hand, of course it did, but nobody knew that it was going to get to that extent. What was it that got out of hand though? I mean, you know, what, why do you think there was this sudden moral outrage about young people having a good time? I, I think because at the beginning of clubbing and going out, you, you know, the, the clubs, finished at two and you know society said you, you, know, you need to get your kebab and your chips and a taxi home and be in, and be in by three so it was like no my night's not done yet i'm still want to go out i still want to have a good time i still want, I still want to party until the sun comes up now the thing is about that is is that that all the clubs at that particular time were top 40 commercial clubs and that's the music that, that society wanted you to listen to and it got to a point where if you, you know out of those top 40 records you, you might like two of them and then that's the rest of it. The rest of the records you didn't want to hear. But you went to these events, these rave events, you, you heard these DJs playing music like you'd never heard before. You're in this warehouse with all this amazing sound system and, and amazing lights and all these ideals with other like-minded people into this music. And then that got taken out of the, out of the warehouses into these open air events. That was all really exciting times. Whether we, we knew it was right or wrong, it was happening because the repression of being in clubs was getting more and more and more dire. So, for us, at that particular time, our, our fight for our right to party was all about that. So how did it feel then, going back decades later, to play in Parliament? <laughs> for the people who'd shut you down? It, that, was, that was very ironic, <laughs> to say the least. Um, and it was for charity as well. Uh, and last night, DJ Save My Life campaign. They, they got that across the line that we go back into Parliament, the very place that passed a bill for the Criminal Justice Bill. So uh, people like myself couldn't basically DJ it's a certain amount of people uh, because of repetitive beats would be jailed if they, if they got caught over five or six people. I, I think it was a rite of passage. I think that was fantastic to, to, to see, look, we're not bad people. 
you know, we are entertainers. This is what we do now in, the, in our modern times. And we want to support your cause and we want this music to be something that we can understand. I mean, when I was DJing, I had people from the Houses of Parliament, you know, with a pint of lager, they're sitting there with the, bobbing their heads, all with the suits and everything. Yeah, no, actually, it's not too bad. This is fantastic, isn't it? Well, yes, it is fantastic. It's, it's always been a positive movement, you know. Do you so, think they get the industry now as an industry? Because the support that was given during the pandemic um, was really patchy, wasn't it? It's very patchy, still very patchy today. The only way that we've come back is that we've supported our own self, one way or another, not everybody, to be able to slowly but surely come back to where we are now. And what really annoyed me was when a, a certain member of parliament, and I won't even mention her name, but you might know who she is, she decided whatever you was involved in, you need to now find another job because whatever you was doing will, will not get come back because we're not supporting it anymore was annoying to a lot of people. It was like, uh, you can't work for th that amount of time and pay your taxes and then to be irrelevant in, in what you basically have believed and worked so hard for. The amount of revenue that this creates for, for the government at the end of the day, because everything gets taxed, is billions. I've done two parties in the UK in the last 18 months. And so that's not a lot of parties in the end of the day. That's not going to keep me in, in, in the realm of, of my overheads and my own self and the things that I have to pay for. But I will continue to, to strive based on my belief of the people and the scene itself. So I'm not doing it for the government, I'm doing it for the people that supported me over the years to, for me to be where I am today. I mean, perhaps the sort of the, the, one of the fundamental problems in terms of, you know, the establishment and politics and clubbing and music is drugs and, you know, the involvement of drugs in, 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 in dance music. So what, what do you feel about this now? I think the thing, the thing about the whole drug scene around the, around the race scene, it's always been a social problem. It's never been fueled by the, drug, by the race scene. It's so difficult for people to understand that the, the reason why people like this music and like the scene and like the idea of it all, and they want this and the, and the coming together of it, because that's how it makes you feel. If an individual wants to basically take drugs while you listen to this music, that's up to that person, he or she, to decide whether they should do it or not. And the, everyone knows the consequences of it if you know that you're taking something that you don't know. So we have a new problem now, which is this vaccinations, in which more people are talking about that than anything else. And the thing about the vaccinations is that we want to be people to be safe in the, in, the, in the environment of what we create and what we love, to be able to move around in a way that we're kind of comfortable in, in our surroundings or where we are without thinking, are you COVID safe? Are, do you have, have you had the vaccination? We don't want those conversations. We want to basically be, be happy knowing that we can move around, knowing that we've done the right thing in the end of the day. And I understand it that, that people don't want to have the, the jabs, don't have it. If you've got people who don't want to have them, it's because they, they feel that they want to kind of carry on in their lives outside of the club scene even. The thing is about the drugs in, in, in the race scene of where at that particular time it seemed to be an initial problem based on it's, you know, it's so experimental that it could kill you. I've been in it for 30 years. If that was the true case, it would have wiped out a whole nation of people all over the world, which would have been worse than the pandemic. What, what do you think is the relationship though between the drugs and the music and the experience? I mean, you know, can you separate them totally? Oh, I don't know. I think it's down to the individual. I think more than anything else, it's always been, if you say you can't take drugs, you're going to take them. That's got nothing to do with the government or anybody. That's up to, that's up to you by what you want to try and ex experience. I, I, feel, I feel like, you know, some parties are so amazing with, without people being on drugs because they can actually hear, see and feel what they're actually listening to and feeling and enjoying and, the, and that euphoria of it all. If my door's open for people to walk in, it's up to them to decide what they do or what they don't do. If I say, you can come into my party, but you can't take drugs, I don't want you to do it, they're going to do it. It's like anything. You can't smoke. Yes, I'm going to. You know, you can only have two pints. I'm going to have four. So the whole drugs, I think, is, has been something of, of, of yet yeah, it's been hand over, over fist in some ways, but it hasn't been the reasons why the scene has still lasted for so long. You've always said music is your drug. Mm. So, I mean, has it just been a practical thing for you that you've never needed drugs? No, I mean, if I was taking drugs for 30 years, I wouldn't be here talking to you. It's impossible. And, as you can clearly see, you know, um, I've, I still feel good about myself because at the end of the day, I've, I've got, I'm, a, I'm in a responsible position to be able to get people to understand that I'm still here with this energy and this power based on the music that's got me through 
everything. And I would absolutely ruin it all if that's the path that I would have taken. So how do you play 10 hour sets? Yeah, that, that's a really good question. I mean, you know, the night before, I make sure I get a really good sleep the night before. Make sure I don't drink too much because I want to keep going back and forth to the toilet. Try and stay off meat because <laughs> that can go through when you're moving. So, you know, try and, try and have like fish, kind of light supper, that kind of thing. All of this is really important. So when you get there, you know, the idea is that you focus on what you're doing and you, what you try and do for the first five or four or five hours is keep the tempo at a really good level and just keep people waiting and waiting and waiting until you kind of push the button on the next step of how you take them to the next five hours or four hours. I mean, my, my set, was, which, which became legendary at Space, was 10 hours, but it only got recorded for nine, so everyone says it's nine hours, which is fine, but <laughs> the last hour was unrecorded, so it was 10. But meanwhile, um, I went to the toilet once. I had two slices of pizza when I was halfway through my set, and that was it. That was enough to get me through the rest of the set. Without any chemical stimulation? None. At all. Just extraordinary. Yeah, it, it is, yeah. I, I, people don't understand that, that I'm so into what I'm doing. At the end of the day, if I had that, I probably wouldn't get to the four hours. I would have completely burnt myself out by it, or got to five hours and gone, no, I'm, done, I'm out. You nearly gave up, didn't you? You nearly walked away because people were killed at one of your shows. Yeah. What happened and how did you turn that round in your own head? Now, I didn't realise that, you know, being in, in Venezuela was the wild, wild west, that nearly everyone's got guns and everything. I'm just, I didn't know. So I get in the car, we go to the event, and I go on, and the crowd lifts, and I'm on the mic, and everyone's happy. And then uh, in about 20 minutes into the set, I'm just about 124 BPM, just taking it nice and easy. Fireworks are going, bang, bang, woo. Everyone's like, ooh, wow. I'm like, well, this is good. They have a record going in, yeah, ooh, wow. So in another 20 minutes later, I'm playing, and I'm still playing, and I can hear the fireworks going off. And I'm thinking, oh, here we go, okay, a bit more. Ooh, wow, so looking down. I couldn't see any fireworks, but all I could hear was bangs and bangs. So I'm thinking to myself, well, I can't play on because in front of me, everyone was scattering. And I saw four people in front of me being shot, basically. Blood pouring out and all this was going on in front of me. And I'm just like, okay, I don't want to jump down off the turntables because it might look like I've been shot. Because the thing was there was a, a guy with a television camera that was trained on me at that time and then trained on the crowd, which you see the, the, the crime scene, and then trained on me based on what I, my actions were to, 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 to kind of slow the music down and then get out. It was back trained on, on, the, on, the, on the dance floor. And then I got basically shoved into this toilet area and I was there for about an hour while I could hear all these screams and, and all this going on. So that, of course that had an effect on me. This was like, I've been DJing for so long I've been, I've been all over the world. I've never seen blood on a dance floor like this. This is something else that I have to basically take on board. You know? And it wasn't against me. It was basically cartel business, something that these guys have been trying to get these people. And eventually someone got on the phone and said they're in there. And because of the security, let them in with the guns. Was that they were able to do that. Once that happened, the next morning, I got the first plane out of there, and Venezuela's here, and Barbados is here. I went, whew, boom, went to go see my family. And I didn't tell them what had happened. I'm just, their son has come home, I'm just come to see them. I didn't tell them because that would have just absolutely um, killed them in some ways. They would have been like, oh my God, you nearly got shot. Ah. You know, um, I didn't want to do that. So I just thought I'd just be there for them. They were happy, and that's it. But in my own mind and, and the way how I was feeling about that. I didn't want to go back out again to, to do what I love to do for that to happen again to anybody. So that week it was kind of really difficult to, to feel about carrying on in such a way. Have I come to the plateau of my career, my life, you know, playing music to the dark floor uh, for it to either carry on in a way that I like to see it carry on in a sense of being positive or is this going to continue uh, after after what's happened, because I still had about five events in South America to continue on. So I took a deep breath and I said, right, I will go back out, but I want more security on the, on the people who are going into the event, and I want maybe two more around me. So there's nothing that can happen. I don't want a bulletproof screen. You know, I don't want to be further away from the people. I just want to be able to just 
kind of get, part, get back on the horse and get see smiley, happy people faces again. And once I decided that I'd done that because people had known what had happened to me, the event was just fantastic. The support and love was amazing. Um, my phone was ringing off the hook because people thought that, that I would stop. People thought that um, I've come to the end of my career. This is it. You know, I'll never get past it. Um, it was a difficult time for me, to be honest. Uh, but I decided that I would carry on and for the sake of the people as well that give me so much energy to be able to do that. Um, I'm still traumatised by it today. Still, I can see it clearly, exactly what happened. Um, but it wasn't against me, it's, it's Venezuela as a whole. They have serious problems with, with their government and it will always remain to be so. And there's nothing I can do about it. Have I been back there since that happened? No, I can't do it. I just want to talk to you about race really because you you talk about having suffered some racism at school, as you would, as we yeah. all do. Um, but you say being black is not, is not defining for you. No, I mean, if you look at you know, the Paralympics, and, you know, nothing stops them. And the reason is, is that because I don't see it as a problem. You know, at the end of the day, people are people. If, 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 if I cut you with a knife, you bleed red. Well, I hope so. <laughs> My door's always open. I've always said, if you, it doesn't matter who you are, it doesn't matter... Uh, uh, Anything, one leg, two legs, deaf. I've, I've had people who literally come in who are deaf and come in and thank me for giving the vibrations of the music that I play. I mean, that's incredible to even have that experience. I just reach out to people because I see people as people. And I mean, every time you kind of see out, there's more majority white people than there's black people, but that's their choice. What, why is that? I think it's just their choice. I mean, I, I kind of, um, I've always been urban in my way, but I don't really have that true blackness about me in that way. So I, I don't get into drill music. I don't get into trap. I don't get into that, that sound of, of black urban, you know, London style of, of music. I've, I've been brought up in another way. I was a black family in a white suburban neighborhood who basically were the, the family that would bring joy to the, to the street because of the music we play and that sort of stuff. But I've always seen people as people. So if you can't accept me for who I am because I'm black, then that's a problem that you have and not what I have. And that's probably where it stands. But do, do you think house music, techno, all the, all the styles of music you have been famous for, are, are they predominantly listened to by white people rather than black people? It seems so. And do you know why? It I seems mean, so. <laughs> Because the crowds so. are white, aren't yeah, they? Well, I mean, I mean you know, you don't, you, don't, you don't need me to tell you. It's, it's a weird thing, you know? But I just think because um, my family wrote Roots and Ties of Bayesian, and, you know, it's, it's a country of black people. But because I don't kind of like, you know, fly the flag for, for blackness, I flag the, well, fly the flag for equality in everything, I'm literally in the middle of everything, you know? Um, and what that, what that stands for is that I understand people's plights on where we are. I mean, there is black people that come and hear me play and they really enjoy it. In America, it seems that there's more black people coming to my events than there is in, in the UK. Why is that? Because a lot of the music I play in America is black, black, black music made by black people with that sound that I enjoy. I still play that sound in the UK and there's still more white people listening to it than black people. I don't know. It's, uh, it's just one of those things that has, that has really kind of baffled me as much as it has you asking the question, because if I played a different type of music, of different sound, there'd be more black people than there would be white people if I did that. And can you carry on doing this forever? I mean, can you carry on doing dance music for young people into your 60s and 70s? Yeah, and... what a brilliant question. I mean, you know, when I was, uh, I think, 27, 28, Pete Tong, uh, and I did an interview with, with him and um, he asked the same question, how long do you think you're going to be doing this for? I said, oh, I don't know, maybe till I'm 45, pretty old. And, you know, by then I don't think the scene will carry on anyway and I'll be just doing whatever I'm doing. I saw that interview about two, two years ago, <laughs> 45. I'm thinking, I'm way past 50 and I'm still at it. You know what I mean? It's like, oh my God. Um, talk about eat that book um, based on keeping going. Do you feel different to your audience though or do you feel part of the same thing? I feel like Uncle Carl actually you know I feel like that gatekeeper to the scene you know and you know it's all right having these young ones playing but you know you could trust good old Uncle Carl to play some good techno 
what's really nice about it is that I'm still being appreciated by, by, by what I've always felt, that I'm still giving you the love and sharing the love of music from that point of view, not because I've got 2.8 million people on Facebook or 1.5 on Instagram and I've got a record that came out and that got 1.6 million TikTok likes or whatever. Forget all of that. It's good old Uncle Carl still giving you the music. The phone's still ringing and everything that's going on about around where I am at the moment in the sense of my career is still on the rise and on the up and up. But as a DJ, there will be a cut, a cut off somewhere. There will be something of which I go, you know what, I think people know who I am. And I think people now understand that there was one person in this world that made a difference when it came to DJing. It's me. And with that, I can walk away from it and go, OK, now it's your time to do what I believe you can do with it. And that's to look after the, the music and the scene itself. So what do you want your legacy to be? I think my legacy more than anything is, is that I made people happy with my music and with my decision to not be a scaffolder and to be a DJ. And are there, are there any causes or issues that you quietly burn about that we don't know because you're too busy being happy? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, so it's just negativity and, and, and how we become non-mindful of other people. It really hurts me to know that one day someone can basically hold you up you know, and, and to, to, to see that you're creating a path that someone could follow to to you have an opinion on something and they want to cut you down and burn you to the ground. Uh, I think it's too easy these days for, for social media to do these sort of things to others. I never was brought up to be like that with anyone, you know. If someone's disrespectful to, to me and then I can't be respectful back to you, it's always the other way around. Even where we are in, in, our, in our times at, uh, of what we're going through at the moment, I think there's really a lot of hatred going on at the moment with everything. Everyone's getting too sensitive about everything. I just like to think that people just get on with your own individual life and make that work for you. If you've got the strength to help others, then you should be helping them. You shouldn't be putting them down in any way, shape or form based on where you're at and, 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 not, and not understand that what's going on with other, other people in the, in the sense of where they are. So many things are going on around us that, that if we all kind of did it together, then maybe we wouldn't be, we'll be in such a bad place. But everyone has such high opinions on everything with the less information that they know about everything that's going on, that all this, mis this misinformation that's going on, is just dragging us down. And um, for me, I like to see that kind of change a little bit. So that's how you'd change the world? I would like to think so, yeah. It's a bit sort of be, be more like me, isn't it? I mean, that's what everyone says about Carl Cox. He's the nicest Carl Cox DJ president. in the world. Yes, <laughs> Carl Cox <laughs> president. It would be a different place, it really would, you know? Um, but most people wouldn't agree with that, so I would imagine. But, Look, I'm an individual that, that started off in life, you know, from Manchester with, with parents that were, were working class and they worked hard to make sure they put food on the table for three children. Um, and we grew up to be where we are. My parents went back to Barbados in 1984 and we were left on this planet to basically to do what we were going to do, to go where we were going to go and to be, be some sort of successful by whatever we ended up being. And for me, I, I've always had that kind of like, inner strength, mental strength, to continue to do what I'm doing. Carl Cox, thank you very much indeed. Thank you.